Continuing in our study of Philippians, we are in chapter 2, and um, I'm hoping to get through uh, verse 11 today, it's the next paragraph, um, and then uh, on Sunday, hopefully we'll um, finish the chapter. That would be what I would like to do, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I'm not too worried about it because we have plenty of time, at least for this book. But I would like to get to Colossians and Philemon as well. Um, so, so far we have, um, in chapter 1, we've looked at how Paul is rejoicing, how he has just this really wonderful attitude about his situation um, in prison and how he is so thankful for the Philippians and for the partnership that they have with him and how he is so thrilled that the gospel is, is, is advancing even because of his imprisonment that just thrills him to death. And, um, uh, you know, he is just, he's just rejoicing. And uh, he's decided that, you know, he, he, if he were to choose whether to live or to die, at this point he would want to live, not because he loves life, but because he wants to help the Philippians and, and continue to help their, their growth and, uh, and their joy in the faith. Um, and then he ends the chapter in verse 27, the last paragraph uh, of the chapter, by beginning to open up the thought of some things that they needed to do, some things that they needed to work on. And he says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And this is kind of opening up this subject of having the one mind, which we're going to talk about in chapter 2. And so you, you kind of see that Paul has kind of been buttering them up a little bit. You know, saying, you, you guys are great. I love you. I love you so much. I just have the, these deep feelings for you. But you need to fix some things, you know. Um, and so, so he begins chapter 1, uh, chapter 2, uh, with this subject. And if I could have someone read uh, verses 1 through 11 of chapter 2, I would appreciate that. All right, thank you very much. Um, okay, so in this uh, first verse, basically, he, I believe he is summarizing what he's already talked about in chapter 1. Encouragement in Christ, uh, comfort from love, participation in the Spirit, affection and sympathy. He's discussed all of these things in relation to the Philippians in chapter 1. And he's shown us that he has all of these things. But he says, if, if all of that exists, I still need you to do one thing. 
I still need you to complete my joy by doing what? Being unified, right, okay. What did you say, Sandra? Being of one accord, okay, yeah, unified. Um, the New English, um, is that what I have? New English Standard Version, thank you. Uh, the New English Standard Version says, uh, being of the same mind. So I'd, I'd like to look at this, this next section real quick and try to understand exactly what he's talking about. Being of the same mind. Um, the New English Translation says to f uh, the notes that they include. And that's one, one version I like because they do include so many notes that help you understand um, the original meaning of the text. Uh, but they, they say the notes, the notes say that uh, this means to feel the same way or to think the same thoughts. So to be of one mind um, makes sense. And he says uh, this is accomplished by, he continues to explain it by telling them to have the same love. So part of being one mind is to have the same love. And so then the question is, what does he mean by that? What is the same love for who? Yes. God and each other. Okay, turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. I think this is the same idea that John writes about in 1 John chapter 4 and uh, verses 19 through 21. Very familiar passage. <coughs> Um, and backing up to verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So, I believe this is the love that Paul is talking about to the Philippians. They have to have the same love. It's a love for God. And we, we love him because he first loved us. But that love also extends to our fellow man, our brethren. So, we all have to have that same love. And that's part of having the same mind. Um, then he says, being in full accord and of one mind. So what does it mean to be in full accord? Are we supposed to carpool to church? Is that, is that what he means? No? Oh, not a Honda Accord. A full... <laughs> what does that mean to, ha to be in, in full accord? Yes, Gail. <laughs> um, oh, I Okay, interesting. Um, and and, and I, I've heard that somewhere before. I did not find that when I was look, you know, doing study for this, but, but it's a very interesting illustration. <laughs> Probably was. Um, but um, yeah, that, that's an interesting thought. Now the New English, the New English, the Net Bible uh, says it translates this uh, in well in the notes. It says that this means to be fellow sold, and I, I think we can see that in the idea of the rope, where 
you know, all the strands are individual, but they're lined, they're aligned together, they're twisted up in each other, and by that, they're, they're stronger together, uh, which is the, the idea that we see at the end of Philippians chapter 1, about standing against the enemy um, by being standing together. The, um, the Greek word, and I won't bother to try to pronounce it, but basically means of one, of one mind, of one accord, and, it, and it's made up of two words. One means together with, and the other means the soul, or the self, or the inner life. So basically, we're all wrapped up in each other, right? We all are of one accord, and it refers to being united in spirit, or harmonious. Yes? Oh, <laughs> really, what version is that? New American Standard says united in spirit, okay. So, so we have some harmony here amongst uh, the different uh, translations that we use. And so it seems that Paul desired the Philippians to be united in their affections uh, and one in Christ in all their desires. Yes. And, and so I, I think what we're seeing here is Paul, you know, he, he points out the love, having the same love. We're all supposed to love one another and be united in our love for one another and for Christ. And so that unites us that way. And then also we are, have this general feeling of being one. We are one body, one group, united together. Yes, Gail. He describes how Okay. Uh-huh. Yes. 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 Right. Right. Now, and we'll get to that in just a second. But, but first, I wanted to point out that he says that we're supposed to be uh, in full accord and of one mind. Well, he already said of one mind. This is the exact same word that's translated in my Bible being of the same mind. So why does he say that twice? Well, I think he's trying to emphasize the point. You know, this is what it means to be of one mind. You have the same love. You have the same um, soul, the same spirit. And basically, you're a, you have one purpose, one mind. You are together. Everyone is together and united. Um, the Greek word means to have uh, the same understanding, the same wisdom, the same feeling, the same thoughts, the same opinion of oneself. And we'll talk about our opinion of ourselves in just a minute. Um, and... Uh, and so on. So Paul seems to be telling them to all think of themselves the same way or to have the same opinion of themselves. And what do you think that common opinion of themselves should be? Yes. In verse 5. Okay. And what does verse 5 say? It's humility. Okay. Okay. And that's what we're leading up to. We're leading up to this idea of hum humility. Paul is going to tell us exactly what, the kind of mind we're supposed to have. And it's the mind of Christ. Okay? 
Uh, so that's, that's what we're leading up to. Uh, so having read this, do you think this is a problem for the Philippians? At one point I raised the question, is Paul simply reminding the Philippians what he's supposed to do, or is he telling them about a problem that they have? What do you think? Right. 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 And so, you know, maybe they, maybe, maybe they just need to shore it up, but they definitely have an issue there that Paul is concerned about. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that, that brings something to mind. The best preachers, you know, the, in, in my experience, I don't know about you, some people like preachers that just get up there and preach what you already know, that preach, you know, what you're already doing and make you feel good. But to me, the best preachers get up there and tell you what's wrong. <laughs> Tell you what you need to change, what you need to improve. I, I, I uh, feel so much better having heard a sermon that steps on my toes than having heard a sermon that I'm like, okay, well, um, yeah, I knew, I knew that. That's not a problem I have, you know. Because, it, well, and part of that attitude problem is with myself because as soon as I say I don't have a problem with that, I'm going to have a problem with that. <laughs> But, um, but it just makes the point that Paul would not waste their time telling them things that they already knew. He's going to point out the problems. He's going to spend this time in his letter telling them what they need to hear, not what they already know. Um, all right, so any other comments before we move on from uh, these first few verses? And, oh, and I'll point out that in chapter 4, I pointed out this before, in chapter 4, verses 2 through 3, we see that they actually do have this problem, at least amongst some of their members. And they need, they need to fix it. Paul makes it very clear there um, that they have some things they need to fix. Okay, so in um, verse 3, he begins to explain exactly how to do this, how to have the same mind. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Well, we understand these ideas, right? Selfish ambition is um, the idea that my way is, is, is the way. I have big plans for this church. I know how things ought to be done. And so everybody just follow me, right? Uh, I want to lead, so get out of my way, you know? That, that kind of attitude. That's not the attitude we should have in the church if we're going to have this unity. Um, let nothing be done out of selfish ambition or conceit. Well, we understand the idea of conceit. The idea of conceit is, I know what's best. You know, I'm the most learned person here, and so you all listen to me, and I will tell you exactly what we have to do. Um, and everybody, again, everybody follow me, right? So this is not the, uh, the attitude that we're supposed to have the church. It's not my way or the highway. It's not I, um, my plans um, are the ones that everyone else has to follow. The antidote to that in verse 3 is humility. Count others better, more significant than yourselves. Count others more significant than yourselves. And so the attitude is, tell me what you are struggling with. I want to know about your needs. What's your opinion about what we should do? Um, what idea do you have that I can help you with? Counting others more significant than ourselves. Just because I have an idea doesn't mean everybody else has to uh, follow that. And, uh, and I shouldn't have that attitude. So who, to whom does this admonition apply? Each 
one of you. Um, yeah, all of them, right? All of them. All of us, <laughs> even more important. Me, even, even more important than that. That applies to me. Huh? What? <laughs> That's right. Oh, no, no, no. I am not more. The application of this verse to myself is more important. Um, and so, so we need we need to think about these things soberly and understand our own attitudes and understand, you know, am I full of selfish ambition or conceit in this congregation? And is that hampering the unity of the congregation? Or am I counting others as more significant than myself? Um, okay, and then in verse 4. So that, that's one thing. Humility. And then the, the next thing is, um, in verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Um, and by interest, he doesn't mean what's your favorite TV show. He means um, where you're coming from, right? He means what you, uh, what, what your needs are, you know, um, what your desires are, what your uh, problems are, what your issues are. <laughs> yes. I think that's a good word for that. So is it wrong to have interests of your own and, and to be concerned about that? Right. Right. Exactly. And, you know, uh, it's very easy for us to get wrapped up in our own interests. You know, we all have problems. We all have things that worry us. Um, and uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about those things. And sometimes we're, we are blind to what's going on around us. That happens to me quite a lot. We're blind to what's going on around us. We don't see the problems that others are having. We don't see where we can help others um, and try to, try to understand what it is that they need in their lives and how we can help fulfill that. And, um, you know, I think the way it works is that once we start to focus on others more, our problems kind of seem a little less a problem. You know, at least because we're not so wrapped up in it. And it just kind of gets taken care of to some extent. So, focus on others. Yes? All right, well, and that leads right into the, this next section uh, of this passage. And are there any other comments on the first four verses before we move on? Because, because the next thing he says is, have this mind among yourselves. And he's just told them to have the same mind, right? Well, here he's going to say what kind of mind that is. He's going to explain it even further by giving us an example. Have this mind among, yours, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Kind of reminds me, you know, Maybe your dad might have said to you at one time or another, use that head. on. You've got a good head on your shoulders. Use it. Well, Christ has given us this mind, and we should use it. Um, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now, uh, he, my version, the English 
Standard Version, there you go, English Standard Version, says, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, most of your modern versions are going to talk about it in that way. Did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That's ESV, NASB, NET, all put it that way. The King James and the New King James talk about it not being, uh, Christ thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The word that's translated robbery in the King James can be translated robbery or grasp. Okay, it, it has either one of those meanings. Um, and you could think of it in, in either way, right? Uh, because Christ was God. We, we learned that from John chapter 1. Christ was God, and so it would not be, he wouldn't be stealing anything in order to be equal with God, right? Because he was God. Um, but in the context, I like the translation that equality with God, it, he did not count it as a thing to be grasped. Because you see, the next thing he says is, he did not count, count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. You see, there's a, there's a contrast there. Instead of grasping at being equal with God, instead of trying to hold on to that, he emptied himself. He let it go. He emptied himself and took the form of a servant by being born in the likeness of a man. Now, that's humility. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what Christ went through just to do that? To leave being equal with God and to come down and be with us? Us schlubs down here? I mean, who would want to do that? Who would want to leave heaven? You know, forget about being like God. I mean, what angel would want to do that? Come down and be in the form of a man and be with us down here. That's crazy. But Christ um, humbled himself that much. But you know what? That wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. It says uh, he became... He humbled himself by becoming obedient... And I'll stop there. So it wasn't just that Christ let go of his Godship, if that's a word, and came down and became a, like a servant, like a man. He didn't just come and be a man. He could have come and been a man and said, okay, I'm in charge. I know what to do. Just follow me. I'm king now. No, he didn't do that. Why? Because that wasn't God's plan. So he became obedient. Not only did he come and be a man, he became obedient. Humbling himself further. And we see in Hebrews chapter 5, you'll turn with me there for a second, that this is a significant point. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, the Hebrew writer is telling us here that if Christ had not learned obedience, he would not have been made perfect. And he would not have been the source of eternal salvation. And so, it was necessary for Christ to humble himself to that point. For who? For God. But for us. For us. Because God loved us that much. But that wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for him to become an obedient man. It says he became obedient to the point of death. Not only did he obey, but he gave up his life. He humbled himself that much. And in Matthew 26, this which kind of goes along with what we just read in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 
7, we see exactly how humiliating that was for Christ. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, I've heard people explain that, you know, that what I'm about to say is not true. I don't understand how you, how you get that this is not true. It seems very clear to me that Christ didn't want to die. That Christ was not looking forward to what was about to happen to him. And he asked that it be taken away from him, if it, if it was at all possible. But, even though he didn't want it, he was willing to do it. And, and I, I, don't, I don't know how you explain that any other way. But, um, did you have something, Keith? Right. And so, so, he was obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And there's the final humili humility. The final humiliation is the word I'm looking for. So we go from being God to being put to death, not just, not just dying, but put to death by man, by the creation, in the most humiliating way possible. As Wayne has told us many, many times, wearing a cross is like wearing an electric chair, except even worse. <laughs> except even worse, you know. And, and uh, I mean, I'm not saying don't wear a cross, but think about that. You know, just think about what that cross means and what it meant back, back in those times. That was the, the worst criminals put to death by crucifixion. Right. 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 Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, we don't go around uh, where the Jeffrey Dahmer t-shirts on. Right? <laughs> you know. Uh, same, same idea. Those that don't under, I mean, we think we understand who Jeffrey Dahmer was, but those who, uh, but people that didn't understand who Christ was would think you're crazy for lauding this person who was put, put to death on a cross. Yes. Dahmer? Oh, Jeffrey Dahmer, he was, yeah, serial killer and cannibal, right? Wasn't he the one that killed, uh, yeah, he ate people. Yeah, he had a whole cult following of... No, no, that, I'm thinking of Manson. Children. 
Children is Feaser. I'm thinking of Manson had the cold. Okay, so real quick before we have to <laughs> before we have to finish up. So 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 this is the point that Paul is trying to make. That's the mind that we have to have. The mind that Christ has given us, the example that Christ has given us. That he humbled himself that much. We have to be just like that. That we Everybody else is more significant than we are. Yeah, right. Um, I don't have time to turn to Luke chapter 14, verses 7 through 11, but you remember the, 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 uh, the story that, well, that's not a story, but the teaching that Jesus gave about if you go to a feast and don't sit at the high places, sit at the low places and wait for somebody to say, you know, come sit here in, the, in, this good, in this good place. Well, that's the same principle. We empty ourselves. We forget about trying to make, make people follow us and make people laud us and praise us. And we empty ourselves and, and focus on service, focus on being united uh, together, just like Christ did, because God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And so just like we can be like Jesus in his humility, we can be like Jesus in his exaltation that comes from God, not from ourselves, not from man. Okay, so we got through that just barely. And, uh, well, we didn't quite. I went over. But uh, I thank you for your attention. Any last comments before we're done for the evening? All right. We will uh, look at the rest of cha uh, Philippians chapter 2 on Sunday. Um, I thank you for your attention and your comments.